So all semester, we've been talking about homeostasis, right, and how the body controls all the functionings through the nervous system is the major controller of that. So we talked about the autonomic nervous system is responsible for all that involuntary control of things, you know, of homeostasis. Well, what is the boss? What part of the brain controls the autonomic nervous system? Do you remember? It's been too long, right? Too many weeks have passed. Kind of an insignificant part of the brain as far as when you look at the brain structure. It's a very small little area, but it does a lot of things. Hypothalamus, yeah. Hypothalamus, very good. So it is in charge of the autonomic nervous system. It's in charge of temperature control. It's in charge of water balance and thirst. There's a vomiting center there that when toxins enter the blood, it stimulates the stomach to empty its contents. So it's a you know, pretty important organ, and it also controls the endocrine system. So it is boss of the endocrine system, and there's a special blood supply that goes from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary to control the rest of those glands. So the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary are kind of partners. Hypothalamus is the boss, the CEO, and the anterior pituitary is the foreman controlling many other endocrine glands throughout the body. So if we look at the major glands of the endocrine system here, we can see that we have the, again, the hypothalamus is actually part of the nervous system, so it's not really a gland per se, but you'll see some textbooks call it the master gland because it does make some hormones, so it has an endocrine function, and those hormones act only on the anterior pituitary gland to tell it to secrete certain hormones. So the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, remember that sits in the cella tersica of the skull. It has that little U-shaped seat, and the pituitary gland sits in there. And then the pineal gland, if you remember that, that kind of hangs off like a little ponytail off the back of the thalamus, and that uh, controls our sleep cycle, secretes melatonin. We'll talk more about that. On either side of your voice box is the thyroid gland. So that's oh, right in the neck, upper part of the neck, or middle of the neck, I guess. And then there's little swellings on the back side of the thyroid gland, four little swellings that are a different gland. We call it the parathyroid gland. They, those cells secrete a different hormone for calcium balance. Remember parathyroid hormone, PTH, the bone breaker we talked about in, in the skeletal system? The thymus sits on top of the heart, so you can't see it here because the heart's been removed, but it sits on top of the heart and it's in charge of our immune system. So T cells, when they're made in the bone marrow, they travel to the thymus and they mature in the thymus. They learn how to recognize self proteins and antigens from non-self. That's where they mature and develop. And that's really important during childhood when that development occurs. So we see a real healthy thymus on the top, on the uh, superior aspect of the heart in kids. But as our immune system develops and we become adults, that turns to fat and we no longer, and it atrophies, it gets smaller. So we don't see a real active thymus in the adults, uh, but we do in kids. Then the adrenal glands are two glands that sit on top of the kidney. So we just finished talking about the urinary system not too long ago, and maybe you noticed those glands sitting on top, but they're not part of the urinary system, so we didn't really talk about it. They do secrete hormones that affect the kidneys, like aldosterone affects the kidneys, but um, the adrenal glands are a two-part gland. The outer edge of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal cortex, just like in the kidney, right? We call the cortex the outer part of the kidney. And then the inside of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal medulla, just like we saw in the kind of the medial part of the kidney was the medulla, those pyramids. So they secrete different hormones, and we'll talk about that. The pancreas is an endocrine organ in control of blood sugar. So it's, it secretes hormones, glucagon and insulin, to control blood sugar, and we'll talk about those. The ovaries secrete the sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and the testes secrete the male hormone, testosterone. So those are all the endocrine glands of the body. You will need to identify those on a diagram or a model, um, the different parts. So do know the anatomy of the endocrine system, but a lot of it is what hormones do those glands secrete and what are the actions of those hormones in the body, and we'll talk about that. So when you look at the endocrine system, working with the nervous system, there's some key differences. The highway for getting the stimulus 
from the organ where the stimulus starts to the cell that needs to respond in the nervous system, that highway are axons, right? Neurons deliver action potentials to the cells that they're stimulating. So it's very quick. So the nervous system, when, when a parasympathetic or a sympathetic neuron is delivering an action potential to cause an action in a certain cell, it's very fast going down those axons and releasing action potentials. In the endocrine system, it's much slower because what's, being, what's the substance that stimulates cells? It's not action potentials, but what stimulates cells in the endocrine system? What are, the, what are those glands secrete? Hormones. So instead of action potentials, it's hormones. And instead of going down axons, where are those hormones traveling when they go from the thyroid gland, say, to a, a cell of the heart? blood vessels. So the highway is the blood. So it takes longer. The endocrine system is a longer, it's a slower, longer acting system. And that's good because if I need to secrete a little insulin to bring my blood sugar down after lunch, I don't want a crash of insulin. I don't want a tidal wave of insulin and then crash my blood sugar. We want just a little bit. Give it a little bit of time, right? How many times, I can't tell you, it's happened to me where I come in a patient's room and they're taking in their first bite of food and they didn't hit their light and tell anybody they ordered so we could check their blood sugar and give them insulin. So we quick run and get the CNA. The CNA runs back in there and she quick gets a blood sugar. And it's an accurate one because that sugar hasn't been influenced by that patient's um, bloodstream yet. So we have time when we're measuring things in the blood before those hormones take action. Not a lot of time, and we're talking five minutes or so, five to ten minutes. So you have to really be quick about that. So. Looking at functions of the endocrine system then, these are all these functions listed here are the result of hormones. So the first function, metabolism and tissue maturation is the thyroid hormone and growth hormone. Ion regulation, that's aldosterone. And we're gonna get into these, you don't have to list them all here. Water balance, that's ADH and aldosterone. Immune system regulation, that's thymosin from the thymus gland. Heart rate and blood pressure regulation, that is aldosterone, from the adrenal cortex, ADH from the posterior pituitary. Heart rate is epinephrine coming from the adrenal medulla. Control of blood glucose and other uh, nutrients, that's the pancreas and glucagon and insulin. Control of reproductive functions, that's testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, FSH, LH. Uterine contractions is oxytocin, milk release, oxytocin. So we're gonna talk about all these, and they all operate by uh, mostly negative feedback, which means if a hormone level is low, the endocrine system, the hypothalamus responds by raising that hormone level. So we're constantly doing the teeter-totter with the help of the hypothalamus, sampling the blood to see if we need more hormone secretion. Some are positive feedback. We talked about oxytocin causes more and more contractions until baby is born. We talked about that in the beginning of the semester. So the hypothalamus, like I say, some call it the master gland because it secretes these hormones that all act on the anterior pituitary. So this is boss. So if we need more growth hormone because a child is in you know, the early stages of growth from zero to 18, let's say, for a female, the, the hypothalamus is sampling the environment and if growth hormone is going down, it, it releases growth hormone, releasing hormone that acts only on the cells of the anterior pituitary and tells them to secrete growth hormone. And then that growth hormone goes to all parts of the body and stimulates growth of all those different cells. So they are partners, the pituitary gland and the, or the anterior pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. But there's a little bit of a different relationship in the sense that the posterior pituitary is a little different from the anterior pituitary. So if we look at this diagram here, the posterior pituitary is the one here in the back. It's just an extension of neurons. So the neurons start, the cell body starts in the hypothalamus, and then there's an axon, and then the axon terminals are down in the posterior pituitary. So if we look at the posterior pituitary, it's actually nervous tissue. And the cells uh, are neurons, and those axon terminals contain the, neuron, or contain the hormones secreted by the posterior pituitary. And there's only two. If you look at your lab packet, that has the list of all the hormones on it. 
and where they're from. So this is on page 35 of the lab packet. You'll see that the posterior pituitary only releases two hormones, ADH and oxytocin. ADH acts on the kidneys, causing them to reabsorb water into the uh, blood. So we pee less when there's ADH secretion going on, increased ADH secretion. When would we want to pee less? What situation is going on in the body where the body would want to say, no more urinating right now? What? Um, yeah, that would inhibit you know, urination, definitely, the sympathetic nervous system. But what conditions, what type of illnesses have we all encountered where urination would probably decrease during this time? Because the body doesn't want to dehydrate, right? So by holding back urine, that's less fluid loss from the body. Where, what other types of fluid loss would be happening, do you think? Diarrhea would cause increased ADH secretion. What else? Vomiting definitely would cause increased ADH to hold on to water, stop urination. Because anti-diuretic hormone, anti a diuretic is something that causes us to pee. So anti-diuretic is the anti-pee hormone. What else? How about if it's 100 degrees out and you're walking around at Riverfest? Exactly, yeah. High body temperature fever would cause that or anything, any kind of exercise, whatever, if you're just you know, sweating a lot. So you're losing water. The body wants to hang on to it by secreting that ADH. So when we look at how these, how this, I'm going to just, um, yeah, anyway, when we look at how the posterior pituitary works, then it just releases them from the axon terminals that are stretching down from the uh, hypothalamus. The other hormone is oxytocin, and that hormone is described on page 511. Let's skip over this right now. Oxytocin causes uterine contractions and milk release, not milk production. So make sure you highlight that milk ejection, not production. That's a different hormone. It's called prolactin. So when oxytocin is released, it's when a couple of different things. Um, it's released during female orgasm. It's released during labor and delivery in a laboring mother getting ready, getting ready to give birth. And when baby suckles at the nipple, those are all the stimuli for oxytocin release. So it just causes milk release through the nipple. So it takes a little bit before um, baby you know, suckles enough to stimulate that release of oxytocin to the blood, which acts on the milk, or the milk ducts in the breast, and uh, milk is released. <clears throat> Sometimes women that are um, nursing, and especially in the early months of nursing, hearing a baby cry will cause milk release because it stimulates oxytocin. Or even when it gets to be time when the baby normally nurses and baby has a really long nap, or mom is maybe has a babysitter and she's out doing her thing, all of a sudden milk releases. So in the first maybe three to four months of breastfeeding, women wear pads in their bras to catch that milk. Otherwise, it just releases, and then there's big wet spots on the shirt. And many young, new, not young necessarily, but any, many new nursing moms who aren't aware of that have been embarrassed because they look down and, oh my goodness, you know, there's big circles there. <laughs> so uh, breast pads are a very important thing. And it's a great thing to give someone at a baby shower because that's what I give. Um, new moms, first time moms that are planning, planning on breastfeeding, that's what I give. I give them lanolin because the nipples get really, really tender with breastfeeding that women aren't aware of. And there's certain things, there's only, only lanolin is what you can put on there because it doesn't hurt the baby and, you know, it's okay if they get that in their mouth. And then um, some high quality breast pads. You read the reviews of which ones women like because do women want to put a, a pad in their bra that has a big sharp ridge that everybody can see they've got a pad in their bra no way <laughs> so you need to look for the really good quality ones and some lanolin and they may open it and be like oh thanks but they will love you in those days after having giving birth knowing that they've got something there to help them during that difficult time because the first two weeks of breastfeeding are very difficult you need to be supportive for the guys that maybe one day will have a 
partner that is breastfeeding their baby, got to support them because if we have found in nursing, women that don't have support for breastfeeding are more likely to give up and quit right away or fear of whatever, you know, good teaching is important too because we know that breastfeeding is best and once a person survives the first two weeks, the soreness, the routine, the milk coming in and getting a, an establishment with baby of how this is all going to work, um, it's the easiest way to feed your baby because you're not heating up bottles, you're not chasing bottles, you don't, sometimes baby's crying, you go make a bottle, you come back, baby's asleep and now you just wasted a big 12 ounce bottle of milk. So formula is very expensive and breast milk is free. And we have found too that back when I was breastfeeding my kids, they said, oh, if you drink alcohol, you gotta dump your milk, you gotta pump it all out and dump it down the sink. Not true anymore. Now they know that the alcohol goes into the milk and then it comes out of the milk. So as long as a person is not feeling intoxicated, if they got intoxicated the night before, that alcohol is not in their milk. So we've changed and learned some new things about that. So more women are breastfeeding, not feeling as confined by breastfeeding as they used to. <clears throat> okay, so going back then. So the two hormones from the posterior pituitary gland that are just stored in those axon terminals here. So it's not shown in this picture. This is the posterior pituitary. Two hormones, oxytocin and ADH. And then on the anterior pituitary, there's a lot more. So if you look at that list again on page 35, for the anterior pituitary, you, pituitary, you can see there's six listed there. And some of those are called tropic hormones, and they just act on another endocrine gland to secrete their hormone. So we'll talk about that. I think, did I go backwards? Yeah. Okay, so when we look at the blood supply then, from the hypothalamus, so these are the neurons of the hypothalamus, when they secrete their stimulating or inhibiting hormones to the special blood supply, it goes right to the anterior pituitary. It doesn't go to the rest of the blood. They have a special partnership where these just stimulate the anterior pituitary to release their hormones. And again, there's quite a few that they release. So if we look on page 35, we have growth hormone that causes growth of all the body tissues. We have TSH, which is called a tropic hormone. All it does is tell the thyroid gland to secrete its hormones. So TSH just goes to the thyroid gland, has special receptors there to tell the thyroid gland, get going. ACTH, adrenal cortical tropic hormone, causes the adrenal cortex to do its hormones. We'll talk about some of those. Prolactin just tells the the breasts to, to produce milk. So this happens a couple days after pregnancy, or not pregnancy, after childbirth. It causes the milk, the alveolar glands to actually produce the milk. And women, again, when they're discharging is when the milk comes in. Not good timing, right? So when they're first learning how to breastfeed, they put the baby to breast, baby's suckling and fighting really hard to get a little bit of colostrum, a little bit of a clear protein. That's the early secretions of the breast before the milk comes in. And they're right where they're going to discharge. They wake up the morning of discharge. Their breasts are tight and full, and milk is spraying out the ends as baby starts to suckle. Now baby's choking and gagging, and the mother is really uncomfortable. Well, now they've changed things, and they give women, encourage them to bring a breast pump to the hospital, or they'll give you one while you're in the hospital, and they pump off that excess and save it for the future, freeze it, and give it to baby later. Um, and then it's not such an adjustment. But for women that choose not to breastfeed, it's very uncomfortable. Now their breasts are full of milk, they don't want to breastfeed, so they tell women to put on a very tight-fitting bra, sports bra, don't touch the breast, leave the breast alone, and the body will eventually absorb that. Sometimes they can give people even a medicine years ago, I don't know if they do that anymore, but um, it'll prevent the, the milk from being released. And women, like when they shower, they're not supposed to touch the breasts at all because any kind of stimulation right after childbirth is telling the body, you know, let's, there's a baby there, let's get some milk going. And think of how difficult that can be for a woman who has lost her baby at childbirth, to know that that milk is there and there's no baby to feed it to. Very, very devastating. And what some women do is they donate their breast milk because there's some women who want to breastfeed their baby, or let's say you adopted a baby from someone who was not able to keep their child because of drugs or, you know, crimes that they've committed and they're in jail, um, they're, they don't have access to breast milk, but some people donate theirs, so that's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> okay, anyway, so that's prolactin. 
Um, FSH and LH are two tropic hormones again. When we say tropic, it just means it acts on another gland. It tells it to do its job. So these hormones act on the ovaries and testes, telling them to do their different jobs. And, and those jobs are listed there. I'm not going to go through them specifically. So when you look at how endocrine glands are stimulated then, going back to the PowerPoint, some glands are stimulated to secrete their hormone when certain ions change in the blood, like calcium. If calcium ions are low, that stimulates the parathyroid gland to, se to secrete parathyroid hormone, which stimulates osteoclasts, which causes bone breakdown and calcium release to the blood, right? We talked about that when we studied the skeletal system because we need calcium for muscle contraction, nerve conduction, and heart muscle contraction as well. Um, the sympathetic nervous system has a neuron that goes right to the adrenal medulla, so when we're stressed out and there's a fight or flight situation going on, the, this neuron is stimulated, the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, stimulates the cells of the adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine to the blood, so that epinephrine is everywhere in the body. And that's how we feel that stress response. And it hangs around for a while because it takes a while for epinephrine to be broken down by the body. The most common is the control via these hormones from the anterior pituitary. So here we can see TSH is being released, stimulating the thyroid gland to secrete T3 and T4. Here ACTH is coming from the anterior pituitary, stimulating the adrenal cortex to release cortisol and aldosterone. And here this would be FSH and LH coming from the anterior pituitary, stimulating the testes to secrete testosterone. So that's the more common way that we have endocrine glands secreted. So oftentimes when we see problems with endocrine um, hormones really going up, it's because of something that has gone wrong with the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary. People get tumors on the anterior pituitary gland and it causes over secretion of hormones or um, defective hormones that aren't doing their job and we see the results of that. So when these hormones enter the blood, they bind to specific cells that have receptors for that hormone. For example, estrogen, the receptors for estrogen, well, let's, that's a bad example. There's more receptors. Let's think of a specific one, TSH. TSH coming from, the, coming from the anterior pituitary gland to the blood only binds to the thyroid gland because the thyroid gland has specific receptors for TSH. So we have to have the re specific receptor in order to stimulate that cell to do its job. Sometimes when we have a lot of a particular hormone, we get what's called, or not enough, I'm sorry, we get, um, it actually it depends on the situation, so I shouldn't commit myself to one or the other, but upregulation is when you have a lot of hormone available, the cells respond by adding more receptors. Other times, you have downregulation where the cells will remove receptors because there's so much hormone available, they don't need a lot of receptors for a hormone, so they'll downregulate. And this becomes a problem in addiction. So when people take cocaine, for example, it floods the synaptic cleft of the brain with the, I think it's dopamine that's being released with cocaine. It's one of those feel-good neurotransmitters, and people feel like really confident. They have a lot of energy. They get a lot of stuff done, so they just fly around on this cocaine, and life is really good, right? Well, then what happens, though, is when that cocaine is metabolized and goes away, the brain reduces receptors for dopamine. So now they get up the next morning, and, and dopamine is one of our feel-good hormones in the brain. They feel terrible like debilitating depression, low energy, and they can't function because of this downregulation that occurred. So when we do drugs that alter our brain chemistry, this upregulation, downregulation is something that people can't overcome. And they have permanent brain changes from drug, from drug abuse. And that's a, a really scary thing that people don't realize. So if you look at people that are coming out of addictions, oftentimes they use a lot of caffeine and a lot of nicotine to bring their energy levels up and to get through their day because they need some type of stimulus because of that downregulation that occurred. And any time, like even marijuana, they're talking about marijuana binds to the same receptors that we have for relaxing and um, coping with anxiety. So if you constantly are wake and bake, they call it, right? You get up and smoke marijuana all day, 
then those receptors that bind uh, other hormones for relaxation and sleep and lack of anxiety are, are used to the marijuana and you're not going to secrete those feel-good hormones like serotonin that make us feel okay. So now you say, well, I'm going to stop smoking pot now because I took a job and they're going to test my urine and I can't do that anymore or I just don't want to do it anymore. Now they have trouble with anxiety, chronic anxiety and, and insomnia. And that is something that is very much out there. And if you talk to anybody that did a lot of smoking of marijuana in high school and college, and I'm not talking recreational here and there, like at a party, like when people drink. I'm talking about everyday chronic use. They have trouble with anxiety and insomnia. But we don't talk about it because there's so many people that are so adamant about saying how awesome it is and how we shouldn't you know, make it a crime that we're not telling people that this is a side effect. And I talked to a chemical dependency counselor and he said it's very real. And the number one reason most young people are entering rehab now is chronic marijuana use. So it's not as awesome as the um, media will tell you it is. If you talk to people that work in, in you know, dependency clinics and addiction clinics and rehab clinics, they'll tell you that it's, it is a problem. Now, is it a gateway drug? I'm talking for people that use it every day, like anything, sometimes it's not enough anymore, right? So people go to something else. So it's not necessarily a gateway drug in here and there kind of use, but chronic everyday use, then it's a problem. Okay, so moving on then. Pituitary gland hormones, we kind of talked about all of those. We'll get into the specifics, but just know that LH and FSH, those are ones that act on the testes. We call them gonadotropic hormones. Gonads are the testes in the ovaries, so they're the gonadotropin hormones. And there is a hormone from the hypothalamus called GNRH. If you look on page 35, the top says GNRH. So when that is released to that little capillary supply to the anterior pituitary, that stimulates release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary, which then goes to the ovaries or testes, depending on the person's gender. <clears throat> okay, so oxytocin we already talked about. Growth hormone, like I said, stimulates growth of all the tissues. It's very important throughout the lifespan really in higher amounts in um, puberty and childhood. But if we see, a, again, a tumor on the anterior pituitary gland causing excess growth hormone after the epithelial plates have fused, so we're talking about in adults, there's a condition called acromegaly. And this woman, this is what she looked like before the anterior pituitary tumor and excess growth hormone, and this is what she looked like later. Look at the difference there. So if we have excess growth hormone after the epiphyseal plates close, we don't see increase in, in height, but we see thickness of bones and cartilage in the face. And if you look at people as they age as well, you look at the people in the nursing home, the nose and the ears grow, right? Because that's just continued growth hormone um, after puberty. But it shouldn't look, I mean, this is a very you know, stark difference because this person has a hormonal disorder. But this little girl is two years old. That is a real person. She weighs seven pounds. She's a midget. And that's not enough growth hormone in puberty or in childhood, before puberty, in childhood. And this one is blocked out, but this is a, um, a person with gigantism, which is excess growth hormone, um, again, before the epiphyseal plates have closed. So that's where people get be, to be like eight and nine feet tall. And do you remember Lurch from the Adams family? He had gigantism. So TSH, like I said, that comes from the anterior pituitary, just stimulates the thyroid gland to do its job. FSH and LH, we already talked about. ACTH comes from the anterior pituitary. It tells the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol. And cortisol is a long-acting stress hormone. So if someone is having a really hard time, say, you know, family problems, relationship problems, work problems, even other health problems that cause a person to be stressed out, it increases cortisol levels. And cortisol levels, um, the good thing about cortisol is it decreases inflammation, but it suppresses the immune system, causes weight gain, and water retention. So we give cortisone to people 
hydrocortisone, right? You've heard of that, creams to decrease inflammation in the skin. If you have an itchy rash, they'll give you hydrocortisone. If you have a patient come in that has really bad lung function, you know, they're all inflamed in their airways, we give them prednisone to calm down their airways and help them breathe easier. Same thing with people with asthma. When someone has rheumatoid arthritis, they have autoimmune functions, they'll give them cortisol, or prednisone is the clinical or the artificial version of cortisol. We'll give them prednisone, again, to suppress the immune system to calm their symptoms down from their autoimmune disease. So it's got some good benefits you know, as a medicine, but we can't be on it a long time because weight gain, water gain, you know, it's not good for you to be on. It causes anxiety. So people that have a lot of cortisol um, tend to be anxious as well. So it's the long-term stress hormone, and that comes from the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone is another one we'll talk about. So melanocyte stimulating hormone increases skin pigmentation. That's another one that's released from the anterior pituitarium. We already talked about prolactin stimulating milk production. So the thyroid gland is in charge of our metabolism. If you have hyperthyroidism, your thyroid gland is going to be a little overactive. And when you have an overactive thyroid gland, you're going to see you know, increase in hunger. So you're going to see weight loss. But some people eat so much that they eat fatty foods that they end up gaining weight with hyperthyroidism. Um, they feel hot, sweating a lot. Um, tremors and weak muscles, um, swollen eyeballs because of it causes increased blood sugar as well, and that sugar draws water into the eyeballs. So you get really buggy eyes, and that's also what Lurch from the Adams family had. He had hyperthyroidism as well as gigantism, and he that's why he had those kind of buggy eyes that people liked for him being in that um, show. And then clubbed fingers. I'm not sure what causes the clubbing of the fingernails. I know it's due to low oxygen in other people, but I'm not sure what hyperthyroidism, why that causes clubbing. But I could look it up sometime. I just haven't thought about it. Um, insomnia, being hyperactive. Again, too much thyroid hormone. Um, hair is great. <laughs> so there's smooth hair and soft skin. Um, Sometimes they're increasing their iodine uptake because the, thy the thyroid gland needs iodine to make um, the thyroid hormones. So hypothyroidism is the op opposite of all that. So what can happen sometimes is people get what's called a goiter, which is a swelling of the thyroid gland. We see it in third world countries primarily because they don't have iodine in their diet. And as a result of that, the thyroid gland is overstimulated by TSH from the anterior pituitary because there's not enough thyroid hormone because there's no iodine in the diet. So the, so the hypothalamus stimulates the anterior pituitary, which stimulates the thyroid gland, saying, come on, increase your thyroid hormone. And, it, and the thyroid gland actually increases in size because of that excess TSH being stimulating it but it can't produce the hormone because it doesn't have the iodine. So we need iodine in our diet, and that's why we have iodized salt. Look at your salt, you know, the big container that you use to fill your salt containers. Make sure it's iodized. Take the time to, to, to spend the extra 30 cents because the difference of non-iodized versus iodized is like 30 cents. Salt is very cheap. Make sure you're eating iodized salt because it's good for your thyroid. So the parathyroid glands, we said, are in charge of calcium balance. So if calcium is low in the blood, that stimulates the parathyroid gland to secrete parathyroid hormone to stimulate osteoclasts, which is going to bring up that calcium level. Bad for bones, though, right? So that's the bone breaker that promotes osteoporosis. So we don't want extra parathyroid production. If we just get calcium in our diet, then the parathyroid hormone doesn't have to work so hard. And if someone has parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, or hyperthyroidism, they have to remove parts of the thyroid gland, sometimes all of it, and then they just give you a pill called Synthroid that acts as, the parath acts as those thyroid hormones. But if we remove that, we remove the parathyroid glands, and then now the person has calcium imbalances. So we have to be really careful that we leave the parathyroid gland intact and just remove the thyroid tissue for people that have an overactive thyroid. 
So the adrenal gland, like I said, sits on top of the kidney. The outer portion is the cortex, and the inside is the medulla. The only thing that the medulla secretes is epinephrine for the fight or flight response. So that's stimulated by the nervous system, that those cells of the medulla, to secrete those two hormones to the blood. The cortex has mineral corticoids, which the corticoid just tells us what type of hormone it is. It's, it's a steroid. But mineral, it means electrolyte. So aldosterone is an example of a mineral corticoid. Glucocorticoids would be an example of cortisol for the long-term stress. And androgens are male-like hormones. So women secrete male-like hormone, which is our androgens. And when we have excess androgens, it can actually stimulate children to enter puberty at like five or six years old. So if you look at this picture here, this is a five-year-old girl. You can see she has breasts and pubic hair that she actually entered puberty at five years old and someone in her village, this was in South America, someone in her village took advantage of that, had intercourse with her, and she was pregnant and had a baby. So this is her, this is her and her baby. This is her at six years old and her baby and the doctor that delivered it. So pretty crazy. So that is from too much AC, adrenal corticotropic hormone stimulating those androgens. The pancreas then. Pancreas secretes insulin and glucagon. The only way to cure type 1 diabetes is a pancreas transplant. So when we look at the uh, hormones of the pancreas, it's for all but blood sugar control. So if a person does not make insulin, their blood sugar is going to be very high, and that's because the cells of the pancreas were damaged. Type 2 diabetes is a different story. That's where we have the cells are not responding to insulin, and oftentimes it's a result of lifelong obesity. So if a person can lose weight, sometimes they can reverse their type 2 diabetes. So uh, the only type of diabetes that you know, can't be cured is type 1, and unless they have a pancreatic transplant, you know, then they're going to be stuck with that their entire lives. Glucagon increases our blood sugar between meals and during times when we're not eating or fasting. Some people do intermittent fasting and they don't eat for an entire day, you know, once or twice a week. The body gets used to that and the pancreas adjusts accordingly and will secrete more glucagon during those times. Where other people have low glu glucagon secretion, if you're hypoglycemic, you can't do that because you'll get shaky and sweaty and have low blood sugar and you need to eat and you need to have fast sugars available. That happens to me sometimes. <clears throat> I tend to be a little hypoglycemic. I was driving in the car one day and I was heading over to some family's house and all of a sudden I started to get shaky and sweaty and I'm driving now and I'm like, oh my gosh, and you get kind of foggy in the head if you've ever had this feeling. It's a bad feeling. And I was looking around the, the car and I found an old candy cane that was half eaten by one of my kids and I just took it and chewed it because it was a fast sugar and it got me until I could get to where I needed to go and then eat something better than just sugar. You don't, because when you have a hypoglycemic episode and you just take sugar, you're going to get another hypoglycemic episode because a bunch of insulin is going to come out to respond to that high sugar you just ate and then it's going to drop you again. So we need to eat protein with our carbs to avoid hypoglycemic episodes. Like if you have pancakes and syrup for breakfast and you're hypoglycemic, you're going to notice you're going to have a hypoglycemic episode as your body surges insulin from that sugary breakfast. So if you want to avoid that, have some eggs or peanut butter with your breakfast or, or cheese, like cream cheese on a bagel, and that'll prevent that. So diabetes, again, type 1, the pancreas is damaged and it's not secreted enough insulin. It's an autoimmune disease because some type of virus we find is what happens prior to people becoming diabetic and it destroys those cells of the pancreas. Type 2, again, is in older people. Obesity is a major risk, risk factor, and the cells just don't respond to the insulin that's being produced. So again, sometimes we can reverse that with a healthier lifestyle. Looking at the hormones of the reproductive system then, testosterone is secreted by the testes, and that promotes sperm production and all those characteristics that make males males. So increased muscle mass, facial hair, that's testosterone. Estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is what makes females female. 
So it causes breasts to develop. It, it prevents the deepening of the voice because testosterone increases the size of the larynx. In females, that doesn't happen, so they maintain their high voice, higher voice. Um, causes fat redistribution, so women are more curvy, so they're narrow at the waist and bigger on the hips and thighs. Um, and then we have this hormone inhibin, which kind of stops some of these uh, hormones from acting. So when sperm production is adequate, inhibin is released to stop sperm production. And inhibin is released to stop follicle development at the end of um, this m cycle. And then relaxin is a hormone that's produced during pregnancy to increase the flexibility of the pubic symphysis, so it's a little more loosey-goosey for baby to squeeze through at the end of pregnancy. And it causes women to have really loose hips when they're walking, and they just feel more laxity in their joints at the end of pregnancy. So going back to the transgender thing, um, testosterone is what women who are trans, um, what's the word? I can't think of the word. They're um, transitioning, thank you. When they're transitioning to male, they take testosterone. And that's under a doctor's care. It's not something that people should just, you know, do. You can buy testosterone on the, on the black market. You want to do it under a doctor's care. And then estrogen progesterone is what males take to transition to female. So those are medicines that they have to take every day to maintain those characteristics. The pineal body, then, is... Uh, an organ that releases melatonin, and that is what helps us sleep. And I have taken melatonin when I am having trouble sleeping, and it works great. It doesn't make you feel groggy in the morning. It just gives you a nice little drowsy feeling, because sometimes if you, like for me, when I work late at the hospital, and I'm on the computer, and I'm really using my brain and charting on a patient, it's hard to just go home and go to sleep, right? You just, your brain wants to keep going. And that's why you shouldn't be on your phone when you're in bed, because the bright light of your phone stimulates or I'm sorry, inhibits melatonin secretion, so the body and the brain wants to stay awake. So if you want to sleep well, you got to turn the lights down low, create a dark environment that promotes melatonin secretion. Or take a pill, right? That's the American way. <laughs> no. I take it every now and then. I don't take it all the time. Sometimes it gives really weird dreams. Like if I have a glass of wine and then take melatonin, bad mix. I've had some really bizarre dreams. Like just a week ago, I had a dream that the, all the neighbors around me, dump trucks were falling out of the sky and crashing the houses and killing everybody inside the house. Where in the heck, dump trucks falling out of the sky? It's the weirdest thing, but it's a melatonin dream. And if you ask other people, they'll say, yes, dreams about killing and murder, it's a problem. So take it with caution. The placenta is what is formed in pregnancy. That's what attaches to the side of the uterus. And then this is the umbilical cord that goes to baby, this kind of beige vessel here, that also secretes hormones. And it secretes it locally. Estrogen and progesterone are secreted right in that uterus and supports the pregnancy and keeps things going. But prior to the development of the placenta, in the first uh, zero to, to eight weeks of pregnancy, the ovaries are secreting the hormones of pregnancy, and it goes to the blood. So it's everywhere, which stimulates the hypothalamus. And in some women, the hypothalamus, the vomiting center, says, what are all these extra hormones going on here? We better stimulate vomiting because we've got a problem. And now people are sick in those first eight weeks of pregnancy. But then as the placenta takes over, those hormone levels start to go down, the hypothalamus isn't stimulated as, not, as much, and then they feel better and they have more energy, they're not as tired, they're not as sick, and it goes a little better. But for some women that are very sensitive, I know some women that have thrown up for the entire nine and a half months of pregnancy, and that is really difficult. Um, I did not have that with my six pregnancies. That's probably why I have six children, because if I did, I would have quit. <laughs> my worst one was my sixth pregnancy. I felt like I was car sick for the first three months and just dizzy and ill all the time. And it was really difficult. But with my other pregnancies, I gained a lot of weight because I wasn't sick and I had a really good appetite because pregnancy increases your sense of smell. So the foods you enjoy taste really good. And then you tend to want to eat more of them and that's not good for baby because it gets baby really big. So as we age, we see a decrease in those hormones as we age. So um, melatonin is a big one. 
Ask anybody in their 60s and ask them how their sleep is going, and you're going to find that they don't sleep very well anymore. They don't have that deep sleep cycle. The REM sleep goes down because of poor melatonin secretion, and just the brain changes with age, and they need lots of naps. And some people you know, are less productive in their jobs because of poor sleep, and it's a number one reason why people retire in their 60s is just being so tired at work that they're not as effective as they used to be. Like a, um, the person used to run this lab, she retired because she was getting poor sleep and she felt like she was in a fog every day setting up test questions and, and um, meeting with students, so she said it was time to retire. <clears throat> Um, the kidneys don't secrete the hormone renin, which is in charge of blood pressure and uh, water balance, so then people have high blood pressure as a result of that. And then we tend to develop type 2 diabetes if we smoke and are overweight. So, again, at the end of your notes is this nice table of all the hormones we talked about, which will be on your lab exam. Oops, is it past this? So be sure that you review those. This is just a little worksheet that kind of talks about some of the concepts we talked about, but you don't have to turn that in or anything. It's just for your review. But page 35 in the lab packet handout is what you're going to be tested on. Those are the terms, the organs, and the hormones.